Good morning, and thank you everyone for joining our fall speaker program. I'm Richard Afable. I'm the president and board chair of Be Well Orange County, our coalition for mental health care here in Orange County. For those of you who may not be familiar with Be Well Orange County, um, I refer you to our website, bewelloc.org, where you can get more information. I want to uh, thank everyone for uh, coming today um, and to um, introduce the program. Uh, this program is being presented by the Center for Healthcare Management and Policy at the Paul Mirage School of Business at uh, University of California, Irvine. Um, the title of today's program is Living in the Future, Healthcare Policy in the Time of COVID, Partisan Politics and Rapid Social Change. Healthcare and healthcare policy could not be more timely and relevant topics for our session today. And we look forward to our um, uh, guest speaker's uh, presentation and to a lively conversation among all of the participants in today's program. Uh, just a few comments on the, the program format. Um, uh, audio for all attendees is muted. Um, and um, this is to eliminate background noise and interference. I'm sure you understand well. We will, however, invite your questions, and uh, we would like you to use the um, uh, question section to submit uh, questions um, on the bottom of your, um, your screen, and um, uh, we will be monitoring those questions and be asking them um, at the conclusion of our uh, speaker's remarks. And so let's go ahead and get started. Um, uh, I'd like to introduce the moderator for today's session, Dr. Murray Ross. Dr. Ross is Vice President with Kaiser Permanente, where he leads the Kaiser Permanente Institute for Health Policy. He also serves as Senior Lecturer at the Kaiser Permanente Bernard J. Tyson School of Medicine. Uh, we are also pleased to make the announcement of the Bernard Tyson School of Medicine coming to our community. Dr. Ross chairs the boards of the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review and the Network for Excellence in Health Innovation, and he has served on the board of the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement. Before joining Kaiser Permanente, uh, Murray was advisor to the US Congress, first with the Congressional Budget Office and later as executive director of the Medicare, um, Medicare Payment Advisory Commission. Uh, Murray, longtime friend of the center and longtime friend to healthcare here in California. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Let me turn it to you. Thank you, Rick, for that uh, kind introduction, and thank you to the center for um, allowing me to moderate the session and to be able to, <clears throat> excuse me, introduce my uh, longtime friend and colleague, Dean Rosen, our speaker. Uh, Dean is a partner at Melman Castanetti, Rosen, and Thomas in Washington, D.C., and is one of the country's foremost experts on America's complex healthcare system and the politics and policies that shape it. Dean advises a wide range of healthcare stakeholders from established players to startups trying to gain a foothold in the nation's capital. He has represented health systems and hospitals, medical colleges and physicians special, specialty organizations, health insurers, clinical laboratories, biopharmaceutical companies, nonprofit foundations, and multinational employers. So basically everyone. Mm -hmm. Prior to joining Melman Castanetti, Dean served as the chief healthcare advisor to former Senate Majority Leader Bill Frist and helped draft and navigate to final passage the landmark legislation that created the Medicare Prescription Drug Benefit. Earlier, Dean staffed the Senate Subcommittee on Public Health, the House Ways and Means Health Subcommittee, and what is now the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. In those positions, he played a leading role in crafting the Medicare provisions of the Balanced Budget Act of 1997, and was the lead Senate staffer in drafting the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996, better known as HIPAA. Dean's experience extends beyond Capitol Hill. He served as Senior Vice President of Policy and General Counsel for the Health Insurance Association of America, now AHIP, and practiced law at Dow, Loans, and Albertson in Washington. Um, I've known Dean since my own days in government, and I very much appreciate his counsel, wit, and unflappability, and I'm honored to turn it over to him for his presentation. Dean? Thank you, uh, Murray, and thank you, Dr. Abel, for uh, your kind remarks. Thank you very much um, to UCI uh, for having me and thank you to everyone who's uh, listening in. Um, uh, while I love Zoom and love being with you virtually, I uh, wish I were in uh, Southern California as uh, opposed to Washington DC today, but um, maybe in 2021. Um, 
Murray, I just want to make sure you all can hear me um, and um, see me before I talk for the next 25 minutes. Uh, you'll see the slides and and I just want to make sure you can all see and hear me. We, we, we can see you, we can hear you, and I'll take this moment to remind people to uh, submit questions through the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your screen. Great. Well, well, thank you again. I'm going to um, I'm going to speak for um, a few minutes to talk a little bit about the election, uh, what happened uh, in brief, what the latest results are. Um, I know you've had a uh, one of the late breaking um, races decided in California in one of the House races just this last week. Um, and uh, things are still evolving. But I think more importantly, what the election means in terms of some of the takeaways and what will happen in the future um, with some of the issues in, in healthcare policy that I know, um, I know that many of you are following, the COVID response and relief, the future of the Affordable Care Act, um, health disparities, um, telehealth, um, <clears throat> Medicaid, Medicare, and other priorities. We'll, I'll touch on these briefly and, and very much look forward to engaging with you all uh, during the, during the Q&A. So first, uh, the results. Um, this was an interesting election, um, almost the reverse of the um, election uh, of uh, Donald Trump four years ago. If you look at the Electoral College, I, um, because the UCI folks are, are, are so good about getting stuff done, um, this doesn't quite include uh, all the popular votes that either part or either um, a presidential candidate received Joe Biden, 80 million votes, the most ever of a president, but Donald Trump, uh, about 73 or 74 million votes, the second most of any candidate. This is a um, pretty close election in terms of the Electoral College. And as you can see, um, there were four states that, five states that really shifted, two in the Sun Belt in the Southwest and three in what, um, Democrats used to call the blue wall, but Donald Trump won last time, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, that allowed Joe Biden to basically, as I said, reverse the results and become president. Um, what's interesting, though, if you look at it was, it was a split decision. Um, both the House and the Senate um, were pretty good nights for Republicans, despite, or I guess we now have election weeks as opposed to election days. Um, but pretty, uh, pretty good night uh, or week for Republicans. Republicans were expected to lose at least 10 seats and they ended up picking up what looks like eight. Um, I looked the other day and uh, it, it looks like the Senate Democrats will have their smallest majority um, that they've ever had in the House since 1875. So that's one historic footnote. In the Senate, um, Republicans so far have lost one seat um, net. They, um, Georgia's actually been called, uh, uh, or Georgia still, I should say, is outstanding, but they lost the seats in Colorado and Arizona. They picked up a seat in Alabama, lost one. We will not know re uh, control of the Senate until January 5th, when there is a double runoff in the state of Georgia um, to figure out who will be the next two senators uh, from Georgia, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an interesting race. You had two races because uh, you had a retiring uh, a Senator, um, Johnny Isaacson, who served in the seat for a long time. Kelly Loeffler, Republican uh, businesswoman from Georgia, was appointed to replace her, and she had a very close election. She actually had another Republican run in that race, a very um, well-known Republican member of Congress, Doug Collins. And while the Republicans combined had more votes than the Democrat, Ralph Warnock, um, because under Georgia law, they were less than 50%, that goes to a special election. Uh, David Perdue, the other Senator and incumbent running for a full term in Georgia against John Ossoff won that race, but again, by less than 50%, 49.8%, and so that will also go to a runoff. Those will take place in uh, January 5th. We won't know the outcome. I believe that the outcome is going to favor Republicans. Um, this uh, slide shows 
that Democrats have only won three statewide races in Georgia since 2000. 24 out of the last 27 have gone to Republicans. Um, if you include the one that Biden won, the other two were back in 2002. And as I noted, even Republicans who didn't get 50%, Kelly Loeffler and uh, David Perdue did better uh, than, their, uh, than their counterparts. Special elections tend to um, be more favorable for Republicans generally, but this is a weird year and we will see. I, I think either way, whatever happens, it's gonna be a very close Senate, a very close House um, for the reasons we talked about earlier. And we'll talk about the implications of that. So what are the takeaways of the election? Those are the results, what are the takeaways? Well, this was an historic time. We've, we've had sort of four super disruptors happening simultaneously. We had um, a pandemic, we had a recession, um, we had a major election um, and we had mass protests across the country. Those four things have never taken place at the same time, even back to 1919 with the Spanish flu. Uh, that year, we did not have an, an election. So, um, you know, in, in 1968, we had protests, we had an election, but we didn't have a recession. So this was an historic time. On top of that, we had a Supreme Court vacancy in the weeks before but what was this election about? For me, uh, it really was a referendum on President Trump. Sometimes if you're the incumbent, you try to make it about your opponent. But I think what Joe Biden and the Democrats did successfully was they made it a referendum on Donald Trump's response to the pandemic. And with unemployment um, uh, on the rise, uh, even though the, the stock market had started to come back, with so many people uh, who are doing meetings by Zoom as opposed to in person and other things, people's lives were disrupted, schools, um, uh, jobs, and others. And if you look at these past crises, be it the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, or George Bush, George W. Bush after 9-11, there are, there are historical precedents where a president or a leader has risen to the occasion and been rewarded um, in votes. And there are others, uh, the hostage crisis um, of Jimmy Carter, uh, where the president has been punished. And with a majority of Americans disapproving, many strongly disapproving of Donald Trump's response, it was a major, major factor uh, in this election. But uh, I think for those Democrats who are looking at this race, I think we also have to be really mindful that um, this was not a broad repudiation of everything that Donald Trump stood for, despite how disruptive this historic uh, pandemic was in our lives. As I noted earlier, about 73 million Americans still voted for Donald Trump. Why? Um, concerns that he tapped into, even though Donald Trump was not necessarily the most lovable uh, uh, president of all time, um, his personality uh, was grating on many. His tweets were found to be kind of out of the norm, but um, he was beloved by millions of voters. Why? Concerns about globalization, fear that the economy is leaving folks behind, particularly those without college degrees, anger at political correctness, and a concern that some of the broad sort of left-leaning agenda of the most progressive Democrats went too far. As a result, Joe Biden has the weakest coattails. If you look at the House results, of any Democratic uh, president um, and any Republican president back to uh, JFK. And as I mentioned earlier, the Democratic majority in the House will be the narrowest since the Congress of 1875 and 1876. Um, we're in an unprecedented time. Uh, those of you who um, uh, heard me speak before know that um, I, I talk a lot about this, but um, these are change elections. That's what this slide shows. These are change elections. In the two decades between the um, election of JFK in 1960 um, and the uh, election in 1978, those two decades, we had three change elections where the House, Senator, White House changed hands. In the 1980 election of Ronald Reagan, we had a change election. Um, and then we only had three more in the two decades that followed. In the last uh, in the last two decades, from 2000 until present, we've had 
eight of the last 10 elections until this one were change elections. And this one makes it nine out of the last 11. So change of party in Washington is the new norm. And the parties are not the parties that they were 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 years ago, uh, where people would split their tickets. We become much more tribal uh, and much more divided as a country. This is the exit polls, which by the way, I don't believe all the details of the election polls any more than I believe the entrance polls. Um, they got some things wrong too, but generally um, they tell a story that I think is right. Um, we're divided in terms of our support for Republican and Democratic presidents um, and candidates by our gender, by our geography, by our race, by our education, by our income, and so many other factors. So while Republicans and Democrats in Congress are getting farther and farther apart in terms of their ideological beliefs, frankly, the country's more and more divided. Just look at white voters with, with and without college um, educations. If you had a college degree, according to the exit polls, you were about evenly likely to vote for Biden or Trump. But if you were a white voter without a college degree, you went by almost two to one for Trump. Um, women voters much more likely to vote for Biden. Um, and this geography divide uh, between what we kind of call um, Whole Foods counties and Cracker Barrel counties. If you're in a Cracker Barrel county, you're much more likely to vote for a Republican and vice versa, um, a Democrat if you live in a county with more Whole Foods. Um, and this is sort of shocking as well. Even our policy preferences and our priorities divide us as a country. Um, if you voted because you thought the economy was the most important issue, um, you were 82% more likely to vote for Donald Trump. If you were voting because of COVID, racial inequality, you were 80 to 90% more likely to vote for Joe Biden. And with COVID um, and inequality and these other issues stacking up, there just simply weren't uh, enough votes. So we're gonna be left, I believe, with divided government. Um, certainly Democrats will control the House um, uh, while President Trump hasn't quite given up yet. The legal writing seems to be on the wall. I think we will have a Democratic president sworn in on January 20th. And I think the Senate will very likely stay narrowly in Republican hands. And frankly, even if it doesn't, Democrats will have such a slim majority that it'll be hard to get a ton of major, major reforms done. So I wanna talk for a minute about um, what this means in terms of how a divided national government will govern. And then I wanna talk specifically for the last few minutes about what it may mean for healthcare. So um, I, I wanna make a couple observations. I noted a, a couple of historical precedents in the past. Um, to me, again, they're shocking. What did I say before? Number one, probably the most disruptive time ever that we've had an election with four concurrent um, super disruptors going on, uh, economic disruption, um, mass protests, a major election, uh, a pandemic, uh, Supreme Court nomination. Um, but I noted that the Democratic majority in the House is the slimmest that it's been in well over 100 years, almost 150 years. Um, but there's also some other historic precedents and that show, I think, again, how we are divided, but also, I think, point to a path forward. So Joe Biden will be the first Democrat since Harry Truman to face a Republican Senate if those Georgia seats turn out as I think they will and as most observers think they will, um, uh, again, since Harry Truman. But he'll be the, remember, Truman became president when FDR died in office. The last Democratic president to win an election and face a Republican Senate was Grover Cleveland. Uh, and uh, that I think was even before Murray Ross's time in government. Uh, that was a long time ago. Um, and so what we know is that Mitch McConnell, the Republican Senate leader and Republicans are not only gonna shape the details of healthcare and other legislation, but they're gonna continue to have a big say over who is appointed to key federal judiciary roles um, in the federal bench, and even who serves in the Biden administration in the Biden cabinet. Already you're seeing Joe Biden get some pushback uh, on one of his proposed nominees, a woman named Neera Tandon to run the Office of Management and Budget. And you're also seeing Joe Biden make some choices that he think will, thinks will get through and thinks 
will kind of go along with this theme of trying to unite the country um, as opposed to more progressive um, candidates. And in fact, some of the Democrats who are more on the progressive or liberal side are not happy that Biden is naming folks to his team that are not more liberal or more progressive already. It just shows that already this divided government and a likely Republican um, uh, majority, even though a bare majority in the Senate will have a significant impact at a very historic time. If you think about how long ago Grover Cleveland was president. So I get asked this question a lot. Well, will, will this be a time of deal making and agreement or will this be a time of disruption? Um, will Mitch McConnell, the Republican leader in the Senate uh, and Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi, the speaker of the house who you know well from California and Chuck Schumer, the Democratic leader of the Senate, get together in 2021 and work out major legislation? Well, the answer is yes, there will be areas of agreement and yes, there will be areas of disagreement. Let me give you some of the factors that will shape that. Again, these have healthcare policy implications, but also beyond. Um, so let's make a deal. Uh, by my count, those four leaders, Biden, McConnell, Pelosi, Schumer, have almost 155 years of combined experience in Washington. They know how to get things done. Mitch McConnell and Joe Biden served together in the Senate for dozens of years. They trust each other. They worked out major economic agreements on legislation during the Obama years. Um, and we talked more and more about how there are fewer and fewer moderate um, senators or House members left. Um, there are not too many, but there are three or four in each party in the Senate, and there are uh, a dozen or more in the House that with these narrow majorities could be a very powerful block. We saw just a couple days ago that some of the folks I've listed here, Susan Collins, Republican of Maine, Lisa Murkowski, a Republican of Alaska, Joe Manchin, a Democrat from West Virginia, Kristen Sinema, a Democrat from uh, Arizona, um, and others came out with a compromise on a COVID relief package where a compromise had eluded the leaders. Um, I don't know whether that bill will pass, but I think you'll see that even just a handful of moderates in a one or two vote Senate majority will have a big influence. Those factors lead me to think that there will be deals. There will be deals on COVID. I think there will be some deals on surprise medical billing um, and some other things. But you're also gonna have ideological differences and a lot of other differences that are gonna divide the parties. And there are some factors that indicate to me that uh, it's very unlikely that some of the more aggressive and progressive democratic legislative agenda um, is going to get through. Um, the Green New Deal, maybe a major infrastructure package, um, uh, improvements of the Affordable Care Act, um, Medicare public options, Medicare price negotiations. I think all those things are very likely off the table for the next two years, unless the Democrats win both those races in Georgia. And frankly, even if they win both those races in Georgia, look back at the moderates. Joe Manchin is very unlikely to go along with Medicare for all. And so I think, um, again, I'm talking as if uh, Republicans will likely control the Senate, but even if they don't, I think this will hold true. And, and why, why is it? Why may we not have a deal? First of all, um, Mitch McConnell is going to have to protect 20 Republicans who are running, almost twice as many as the number of Democrats, in battleground states in just two years, including Florida, Wisconsin, um, states like Pennsylvania and Iowa, where the incumbent popular Republican senators have already announced they're gonna retire, North Carolina and Georgia. He's gonna to need to protect those seats. And that usually doesn't mean compromising. That usually means showing differences while trying to get some things done. Um, and at the same time, he, Mitch McConnell, even if he wanted to make a deal, is gonna be hemmed in because remember, if he's got a one or two seat majority, there are at least five Republican senators who wanna run for president. Um, I know Donald Trump wants to run for president, but you've got a lot of Republicans in the waiting and five of those are in the Senate and they're gonna to wanna to show that they're more conservative than Joe Biden, that Joe Biden is um, not someone they wanna deal with because they're gonna to try to start building their case right now to become president. And then you have some of the challenges for Democrats as well. I mentioned Nancy Pelosi having to hold together a very small caucus, but also you've got Chuck Schumer, the Democratic leader in the Senate, um, Chuck Schumer could very well face a primary 
from his left flank. And he's going to want to run and show that he's trying to make progress on a progressive democratic agenda. Uh, he would like to become majority leader, not just minority leader. Um, but he's going to need liberal votes to do that. Um, but having said that, uh, I think while there won't be a ton of big things that get done legislatively, we'll talk about some things specifically in healthcare. Um, the executive branch power is going to be significant. We learned this with Donald Trump. He governed largely by tweet and he governed by executive order, but he got a lot done. Think about the travel ban um, that he instituted early on on Muslim uh, nations. Think about um, his reverse of the DACA, the so-called uh, dreamer policy in immigration. Think about some of the changes he made to the Affordable Care Act through regulation, um, executive order first and then regulation, um, setting up association health plans, allowing short-term limited duration plans to be offered, which Democrats thought undermined the Affordable Care Act. Um, so there's a lot that can be done. I, Joe Biden is going to have a big stack of paper on his desk on January 20th, as soon as he's sworn in and puts his hand on the Bible and watches a little bit of the parade, I think his hand is gonna become tired um, signing executive orders that do a number of things, including rejoining the Paris Climate Accords, um, refunding the, the World Health Organization, uh, reversing some of the Trump immigration policy uh, and other things. And, and then a final note, and, and then we'll, we'll move in the last few minutes here to healthcare. Um, before we get into uh, kind of a dialogue and a Q&A, and that is the future of the Republican and the Democratic parties are very much up for debate, even right now before the next Congress and the next president are sworn in. And what do I mean by that? Let's talk about the Democrats for a minute and let's talk about Republicans. First, uh, Joe Biden, when he becomes the next president of the United States, if he becomes the next president of the United States, and I believe he will, will be older on the day that he is sworn in than Ronald Reagan uh, was on the day that Ronald Reagan left office. Think about that, 78, almost 79 years old. So already Democrats are thinking about, this is how Washington works, <laughs> who is gonna be the next Democrat? Is it gonna be Kamala Harris? Is it gonna be somebody else? And there'll be this fight that's already taking place between centrist Democrats like Joe Biden who want to make a deal, who have governed their entire life on trying to get things done, on working across the aisle, and more young, more aggressive Democrats like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and others who call themselves the squad, but are promoting very progressive, very liberal policies and believe that if Bernie Sanders was the nominee and the party would have run even stronger to the left, that um, Donald Trump would have been even more resoundingly defeated. And that would be a debate that there's no right or wrong answer to, but will play out over the next couple of years in the Democratic Party. And in the Republican Party, um, there, there will be a debate about what the future looks like uh, after Donald Trump. Um, clearly, Donald Trump remade the Republican Party. Um, before Donald Trump became president, there was a lot of views, uh, certainly Mitt Romney, who ran for president before, that Republicans ought to be more open to trade as opposed to more protectionist, ought to be more open to progressive immigration policies, um, which is just the opposite of Donald Trump. Um, prescription drugs, Republicans always sort of favored the drug industry and favored innovation. Donald Trump said, no, drug prices are too high. Republicans were always concerned about deficits. Donald Trump will end up being leaving office with the largest deficit in history um, for a long, long time in any event, and, and there will be that, that fight. At the same time, it appears, as I mentioned earlier, that Donald Trump isn't going anywhere fast. And so I'll, I'll kind of end this section of my talk with one last uh, reference to our friend Grover Cleveland. Grover Cleveland was also the only president we've had in history that served two non-consecutive terms. He won, he lost, and then he won again. And uh, a lot of reporting out of Washington even today says that Donald Trump may well announce that he is going to campaign again for president in four years, even before he leaves office. So let's just conclude in the last few minutes um, with now having talked about the elections and talked about the structure of divided government with a few comments about what it's going to mean 
for the healthcare agenda. And I've kind of kind of divided this into two parts. And I'm going to talk relatively briefly and touch on some of these issues briefly because I know um, that many of you will want to go into these more deeply in the Q&A section. But I've divided this into two sections. Number one, what will, Vi what will Vice President, now President-elect Biden, do on his own? And then secondly, what can Congress do? So first, on COVID, um, I believe, as I said, that Joe Biden became president largely because of COVID. Agenda item one, two, and three are going to be COVID. Um, you're going to see a more robust, coordinated federal response on public health. Um, you're going to uh, hear hire Fauci instead of fire Fauci. I think he's going to empower uh, scientific agencies and career staff at the Food and Drug Administration, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, NIH. Um, there's a lot of concern that the supply chain um, may be bent or broke at times and there wasn't enough PPE, um, there weren't enough um, uh, prescription drugs that were needed at the right time, ventilators or other essential treatments. I think the Biden administration will move more aggressively to take more direct control over the supply chain around health. I, I think you will see the public health emergency expanded. Now, on vaccine distribution, um, as we know, we are very likely to have at least two, maybe three vaccines approved in the next uh, 30 days. Um, before Joe Biden becomes president, the Operation Warp Speed plans that Donald Trump laid, which provides federal guidance, but also largely relies on the states, will already be underway. So Joe Biden, um, particularly because the outgoing president isn't 100% um, seamlessly cooperating with the incoming presidency and administration, will probably not be able to put his mark as much on vaccine distribution as he might otherwise do. But I think on a whole host of other areas, you will see uh, COVID be much more aggressive and much more coordinated and much more consistent public health messaging at the national level. Um, two other areas I think you'll see the most change and then a couple areas where you may see a continuation and some uncertainty, but the Affordable Care Act. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Democrats feel that many of the uh, uh, Trump administration regulations undercut the ACA. So I think we are likely to see a reversal of the Trump policies that allow short-term limited duration plans. I think you will see the Biden administration revisit the Trump Association health plan rule for small businesses. I think you will see much more aggressive Biden administration outreach and enrollment activities around the ACA exchanges. I think you will see them reinstate um, Obama era anti-discrimination protections for individuals who are transgender and others. I think you will see a number of steps that they'll take uh, through calculation and other things to try to improve uh, the calculation of, and the, and the um, generous nature of tax credits. And I think you'll see longer enrollment periods um, to help beef up Affordable Care Act enrollment. In Medicaid, with so many people out of work and relying on public programs, I, I think you will see a lot of um, effort to streamline enrollment and re-enrollment. I think you'll see longer look back periods, less documentation. Um, I think you will see a reverse very early on of the so-called public charge rule regarding eligibility for Medicaid for certain um, Im immigrants. Uh, there are already a number of waivers that have been approved in certain states that have work requirements for Medicaid. I, I don't know the Biden administration will reverse those, but they will certainly be a lot more skeptical about work requirements and other things that they view as limiting access to Medicaid in the future. They will probably work with states that have not yet expanded Medicaid to try to provide some carrots as well as some sticks. Um, states, as we know, are hurting uh, as a result of having to spend dollars on, on public health and other matters with COVID, more money on education, more money on necessities. And there may be some that are, that are desperate, frankly, to do more and to get more um, Medicare, and I'm sorry, Medicaid money. Um, in the area of Medicare, uh, I think a lot of the move to value-based care will continue, um, just as it did under the Trump administration. I think for those in the Medicare Advantage world, Democrats tend to look a little bit more skeptically around um, private plans and private involvement, but I think 
given the almost more than 30 percent uh, of folks who are in Medicare or enrolled in private plans, uh, Medicare Advantage is here to stay. And I think a lot of the experimentation, it'll just be the Democrats who believe more in improving fee for service and government will probably be more active on some of the demonstration and some of the other um, coordination models than the Trump administration did. But I don't think you'll see a radical difference. I also think in telehealth and digital health, you'll continue to see more flexibility uh, for some of the innovations that we saw. I think you will also uh, see a Biden administration that will work on health disparities, uh, some of the differences in, in access to care um, and the impact of COVID on black and brown communities across the country, um, you know, it were quite stark. And this will be an area where I think Biden will focus. Prescription drugs, the last thing I mentioned, will be a little bit of a mixed bag. I think there are some things that the Biden administration doesn't like, but Donald Trump was a different kind of Republican. As I noted earlier on prescription drugs, he was more in favor of, um, frankly, price controls. And I think Joe Biden will probably wrestle with whether to keep in place some of those. Um, on Congress, just to be very brief here, um, I think this really flows from the discussion we had before. I do not see major legislation that will do things like expand the Affordable Care Act with a Republican Senate. Um, unless the Supreme Court uh, reviews and finds that the ACA is unconstitutional and throws the issue back into Congress's lap, and they have to figure out how to put Humpty Dumpty back together again in terms of pre-existing conditions and other things, I think we're much more likely to just have status quo in terms of the Affordable Care Act. But I do think on incremental reforms, surprise medical billing, there's been a lot of bipartisan bills and a lot of interest um, on some kind of uh, proposal that would have a benchmark with some allowance for arbitration. I think that'll finally pass. I think you'll see some incremental uh, changes to telehealth to allow some of the COVID era flexibilities continue, maybe not in their current form, but at least to an extent. There'll be some work on prescription drugs, but not a major, major bill. And I think health disparities and social determinants of health, um, where there's clearly interest on both sides of the aisle, and also some of the crisis that we were having before the current crisis on opioids, addiction, behavioral health, I think we will get back to. So in, in conclusion, uh, Dr. Fable and, and Dr. Ross, I will turn it back to you for questions in just a minute, but let me, um, let me conclude with a couple of thoughts for healthcare stakeholders and indeed, I think for the general public in terms of navigating this unprecedented time of, of change, of disruption um, inside our healthcare system, but frankly, in the country. Um, and, and I say this mostly for those of you who are physicians, who are hospitals, who are health plans, um, who are innovators, who are clinical labs, uh, who are uh, represent patients, uh, consumers. First, I think it's more important than ever to be innovative. Uh, this is a time where innovation gets rewarded. And, and this is true both in the marketplace as well as with policy proposals. This is a time I think to come to Washington uh, if you have something you care about with proposals and showcasing your products that are improving your customers' lives, their health, their experience, and hopefully lowering costs. I would encourage everyone to be collaborative. This is an integrated system. Um, more and more we're seeing partnerships between um, telehealth companies and hospital companies, between Medicare Advantage plans and physician organizations, between um, post-acute care and acute care. Uh, I would, in a policy realm as well, encourage you to partner with other stakeholders in the system. Uh, policymakers hate when they have to make decisions that favor one stakeholder over another, but also party with N partner with NGOs, local leaders, and be collaborative in offering solutions. I would also be pragmatic. I'm working with a lot of clients now who are trying to meet with the incoming Biden administration and, and, and they're saying to me, Dean, what should I do? And my advice is offer concrete, detailed assistance that shows what your organization can do. How can you help with vaccine distribution? Um, how can you help make sure that people are educated, that those messages are out? How can you help with healthcare system improvement? It, um, whatever your priorities are, showcase your organizational capabilities. Number four. I would say it's more important than ever to be bipartisan. Talk to both sides, even if both sides of the aisle are not talking to each other. I noted these change elections before going back and forth. Well, you know, guess what? 
Republicans may control the presidency for the next four years, but if you look at the last uh, history, um, we're gonna have flip-flops in Congress and the presidency, work with both sides. Everything that has gotten done that's been major in the last 10 years has had some level of bipartisan involvement and buy-in. Um, the last two points go hand in hand, and that is um, we are seeing a rise of citizen activism um, enabled by technology um, and, and generated by enormous business change, climate change, social change. It's really important for uh, organizations, be you nonprofit, for profit, corporate or otherwise, to align your policy priorities with your organizational daily values. So if it's diversity, if it's coverage, if it's healthcare equity, um, you need to live in a policy world with what you live every day. And I would also say lead. Um, Washington doesn't have all the solutions. Frankly, I don't think either party believes that anymore. Your employees, your customers, your investors, if you're a, a company, activists, the media, and policymakers are looking to leadership in corporations, are looking to C-suites, and are looking at nonprofit leadership to help partner with government or to help lead the way towards solutions. Uh, we wouldn't be talking on Zoom today if it was a government program. This was a private sector innovation, and I'm thankful that it is and has allowed us to be together. And I, I very much with that conclude and look forward to your input and your questions and turn it back to uh, my good friend, Murray Ross. Thank you, Dean. That, that was a, a tour de force here. So uh, take a moment to breathe and, and have a sip of water. Um, I just want to remind people that they can submit questions uh, through, through the uh, Q&A box on, on, on your screen. Um, I'm going to take the, the moderator's prerogative to offer just um, a, a couple questions, um, Dean. Um, the first one, and you, you touched on this, um, so Leader McConnell has worn at least two hats in his tenure. One is sort of the institutionalist, you know, preserve the traditions of the Senate, and then the other has been sort of a little more, shall we say, scorched earth. And I'm wondering what you see specifically, or you mentioned near a 10, but just um, ca cabinet nominations in general. Do you think we have, we, we go back to the days of, you know, the, pre the president gets his or her choices, um, provided they're qualified, or do you expect a little bit more um, uh, back, uh, pushback? Well, I, I think, you know, Mitch McConnell wrote a book um, called The Long Game um, that I think sort of sums up his philosophy. Um, you know, he's a, he's a survivor. Um, he understands power. Um, he, uh, he's passionate about a couple of policy issues, but um, he's been really very successful at keeping the Republican caucus together and and he was just elected leader without any opposition. I, I think what you'll see is Mitch McConnell pick his spots. Um, and, and specifically with respect to nominations, um, I do not see him being completely collaborative, nor do I see him adopting a policy of scorched earth. Um, he, will, um, he, he will, I think, um, want a, at least one or two symbols of his power to flex his muscle. Neera Tandon, who I mentioned earlier, may be one. We don't know who all the cabinet nominees are. There may be others. If, if, I don't think he will, but if you saw, um, you know, maybe there'd be senatorial courtesy, but I think if you saw somebody like, uh, and you won't, um, but, you know, Bernie Sanders go to the Treasury Department, you know, or somebody that equivalent sort of on the left, um, I, I think McConnell will push back against those. But I, I also think, frankly, that um, Republicans are going to let Joe Biden pick, for the most part, his own cabinet. Why? Number one, they don't want to look overly hostile to women and minorities. Number two, um, as I noted, we've been in an era of change elections, and I think they hope that they're going to be president one day too. And we don't want the, you know, the other party is we're not probably not going to have 60 votes in the Senate, or and we don't want um, 52 votes or 53, and we don't want the Democrats to tell a Republican president who they can pick. So I, I think you will see at least one or two high-level nominees not get confirmed. 
but I think you'll see Joe Biden get most of his nominees confirmed. And, and I think you will see that approach not only on nominees, but I think throughout. And by the way, um, the other thing I think that we, we very much can expect is that Mitch McConnell may say, you know what, I'm not sure I like so-and-so, but I'm willing to work with my caucus to confirm so-and-so, but there's a piece of legislation I'd like you to sign. Uh, and, and so I think we'll be back in some ways to a more traditional Washington where yes, there'll be division, but there'll also be some, some deal making. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, speaking of those senators who are running or potentially running in 2024, there's a, a question from the Q and a, um, not, can you name them? I know you can name them. Will you name them? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, they probably will name themselves pretty soon. I may miss a couple, but, um, uh, Tom Cotton of Arkansas, Josh Hawley of um, Missouri, uh, Marco Rubio of Florida, um, Ted Cruz of uh, Texas. Um, I'm missing one other, but you know, the, the, it, you know, in a, in a Senate, we used to say this, in a Senate with 100 members, there's like 99 who think they can be president. <laughs> so uh, yeah. I, I'm sure there's more, but those are the, those are the four names that get kind of bandied about um, the most, and I, I'm missing one. Josh Hawley. Josh Hawley from Missouri, yeah. Yeah. Hawley, okay. Rubio, Cotton, um, Cruz, one other. And then just to fo follow up on a point you made earlier about um, sort of those senators needing to position themselves on the spectrum, is it is it really a one-sided bet, or is there any opportunity for them to engage in a little bit of deal making to show that they can um, accomplish something? Yeah, it's, the, it's a great question. I mean, we could probably talk for the next you know, hour about the different um, possibilities for the future of the Republican Party. We, um, our, our firm does a podcast called 14th and G, which is the intersection of uh, Washington where we're at. And we did one about a month ago with, um, uh, with my partner, Bruce Melman, uh, and uh, with um, uh, uh, drawing a blank on his name from the Bush administration um, uh, as a chief, ad chief advisor, um, I'll come back to, but it was all about the, the um, purpose of the um, uh, uh, future of the party. And, and I think that, you know, you're, what you're going to see is, you know, you, you'll see differences. You will see folks who run as a carbon copy of Donald Trump. They may be Donald Trump. <laughs> they may be Donald Trump's family. Uh, they may be Vice President Pence. Um, I think you'll see, you know, folks who want to return to Reaganism, uh, and I would put folks like Marco Rubio in that category, maybe a little bit more, uh, Carl Rove, by the way, was the person I was thinking of who we did the podcast with, but I, th I think you'll see folks who want to look at, you know, a more sunny, optimistic Republican Party, a more dominant military, maybe a more openness to immigration and trade, and you'll have those. Uh, I, I think you'll look at folks like, you know, Tom Cotton, and I may put Hawley in this category too, who will run as more ideological Republicans on things like deficit and abortion politics and, and other issues. So I think that it's not a one dimensional issue. And I think with some of them, there will be a, a need not only to be divisive, but to also show they can get things done too. So, I mean, it's a small example, but Marco Rubio, for example, has a bipartisan bill on health disparities and COVID that you know he's working on. Why is that? I mean, you know, I think part of it is he really cares about it. Part of it is politically he wants to position himself as somebody who can get some things done. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to paraphrase one of the, a question that came in on the chat. Uh, so, given that divisiveness and everything else, is there is there any room for a third party? Well, it's it's. Um, I, I always say no to this question, um, but um, here's what we know. We know that third parties, even if they don't win, have played huge roles in spoilers in the elections. Um, we probably would not have had uh, President Clinton without candidate Ross Perot. Um, we may well have had President Hillary Clinton without the Green Party candidates and other candidates who ran last time. Um, so at a minimum, there is a spoiler role. Um, I, I think there's room for a third party. 
Um, I, I don't know how viable it is as a major uh, election. I think what's I think what you saw with Donald Trump was a different model. You almost saw a third party inhabit or inherit the Republican Party. Um, not completely. He had to adopt Republican orthodoxy, but in a lot of ways, he threw Republican orthodoxy out the window. So I, I think it's more likely that what you're going to see instead of a third party is a battle for what the future of the Republican Party and the future of the Democratic Party looks like and realignment rather than a third party that really emerges as a third, a third, a third. Um, by the way, even in this election, Murray, sorry, the last thing I'd say is you saw a very organized, very well-funded uh, Republican opposition to Donald Trump called the Lincoln Project. But Donald Trump still won with 93 or 94% of Republicans. I think a third party as a bona fide third party is very hard, but I think the heart and soul fight for both parties is well underway. Thank you. Um, let's see, just a process question for you. On executive orders, um, and you mentioned, you know, soon to be President uh, Biden wearing out his signing uh, arm. What, what are the limits on what he can accomplish, uh, broadly speaking, through, through executive orders or just sort of reversing executive orders that President Trump had, had written in? Well, you know, the thing about executive orders is that um, standing alone, they generally do not have the force of law. Um, they, they generally, if you look at the Trump executive orders, they, they tell an agency to go do something. Um, and so uh, that's number one. So you can control the message through executive orders and you can control to an extent what your agencies can do. There are some executive orders, immigration being a good example, where the issuance of them alone, coupled with some action by, let's say, the Immigration Naturalization Service or others, does dictate. So, uh, you know, the, the president, as we've seen with Obama and with Trump, can do a lot. I mean, the, the dreamers, the, the, the children of, of illegal immigrants um, uh, under President Obama were allowed to stay into the country. Uh, President Trump had a very different policy. So if you look at that area, the, 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 the executive orders can be powerful, but usually um, they've got to be pulled through. And at the same time, they can be challenged legally, as we've seen, and they've got to have some, um, they've got to have some basis in the law. So I, I think, um, you know, in the healthcare area, I mentioned some specifics earlier, but um, some of it was executive order and, and some of it was um, executive order followed through by regulation. But I think uh, short-term limited duration plans, I think some of the Medicaid policies, Med ACA enrollment and outreach, all those things the president can do. And I think they will reverse what Trump did. Thanks. Um, question from the audience. And this is looking, I think, well, I don't think, um, after certainly after 2022 and maybe after 2024, but what are the barriers to universal coverage in this country? And it, you know, is a, a year and a half ago, there was a lot of conversation around single payer and Medicare for all. And that sort of has seems to have vanished. What, what's your take on it? Well, I think it depends what you mean when you say universal coverage, number one. I mean, um, you have, you could see a universal coverage system, which would not be completely government controlled, but which would build on the Affordable Care Act, but would really significantly juice the subsidies and still allow private plan competition. Um, but, but let's assume that you're talking about kind of Medicare for all or a more traditional um, program. I mean, I think where, where the government really has a more heavy hand. Um, first, there are ideological differences. Um, socialized medicine, government control. And, you know, um, I, I mentioned this earlier when I talked about the fact that you can't take Donald Trump or what he stands for lightly. Um, I think some of the races in um, Florida, for sure, in the Miami-Dade County area, um, the campaign against socialism and how that resonated 
with uh, the, the, the Cuban, the Latino community were powerful antidotes to a democratic sweep. So those words are powerful, but the ideological ideology is powerful. And there are zero Republicans, zero Republicans who are for Medicare for all. The second thing is um, I, maybe two other things I'd mention, which is costs and stakeholder opposition. From a cost standpoint, um, you know, you saw Joe Biden make this case. And for those of you who attended the UCI panel a couple of years ago, you saw Nancy Pelosi's top healthcare person, Wendell Primus, make this case. It's just too darn expensive um, to have the government take, take it over. And then finally, we don't talk about it a lot, but to even get the numbers to work, if you take Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren's proposals at face value, um, the, the, even to cost a trillion dollars or trillions of dollars, what it requires is for hospitals and doctors to be paid at Medicare rates. And that, I, I, I don't know if it's sustainable from a reimbursement standpoint, those of you who serve patients can tell me, but from a political standpoint, um, the AMA, the American Hospital Association and a million others are never gonna let that happen. So, I mean, I think for it to happen, you have to overcome that. And I think what it would take to overcome it would be a president who campaigned on it, not Joe Biden, and a huge Democrat majority in the House and the Senate, not the Democratic bare majority we have in the House and probably not the Republican majority we have in the Senate. So I think it. I'll end where you began, Murray. It's at least a 2024 question. I think it's a 2027 question and beyond. Okay, that's helpful. Um, I think we're going to go just a couple of minutes past the half hour mark. Um, I have one last question, and then I'm going to turn things back to uh, Dr. Pablo, who I also know has a question. And, and Dean, this is something you can probably speak to for an hour, but maybe you can give me the 30 second version. Um, Operation Warp Speed, where the federal government ponied up $10 billion to uh, de-risk the, not the discovery, but the, the, uh, the production and distribution of vaccines, um, sort of not your typical um, Republican policy to, to do that kind of thing. Any lessons there, or is that just, this was a pandemic, that's a one-time Well, I mean, it, uh, it, it's, uh, it's a pandemic, but I don't think it's a one-time thing. I think it, I, I think it, it shows that, um, it, it shows that in a, a collaboration can accelerate innovation. Um, I, I think that I, I read somewhere um, that uh, Dr. Fabley may know this more that, that the, the shortest turnaround time for a vaccine that was produced before this was three or four years as opposed to under one year. And so right. if you, you know, if, even if you're Joe Biden and you've got the cancer moonshot, I think you've gotta be looking at this and saying, you know, this is a little bit like the Marshall Plan. This is a little bit, you know, can we do this in other areas, be it Alzheimer's or cancer or others? Um, uh, you know, why not invest tens of billions of dollars to try to eradicate some of those diseases? So I, I, I actually think that one of the things that, that um, I hope that policymakers and I hope the country think about if we ever stop the merry-go-round here and, and kind of digest what happened here is what are the long-term implications of COVID, good and bad? Um, you know, greater use of technology is clearly one of them uh, in terms of care delivery. Um, but, you know, greater attention, as I mentioned before, that we need to pay to, uh, health equity and health disparities in our system. But I, I think innovation and collaboration uh, between government and the private sector is going to be ultimately the way we get out of this thing. Okay, thank you. Rick, I'm going to throw it back to you. To Thank you, thank you, Murray and uh, Dean. Thanks so much for your so in, your very insightful comments and your expertise, um, and uh, we really appreciate um, 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 your knowledge and and thoughts on this area. I, I, I happen to be attending a board meeting of a of a single standalone hospital just recently, and um, the um, chief executive of the hospital commented to the board uh, proudly how his organization had made it through this, this 
portion of the pandemic, and we know it's not done, we still have a long way to go, uh, but made it through this portion of the pandemic from a financial perspective and achieved a break-even performance through this, uh, these nine, 10 months. However, um, looking at it more closely, um, uh, most of his ability and that hospital's ability to get to a break-even position was because of the subsidies provided to them through the CARES Act. And so without government subsidy, this organization, uh, this single standalone hospital, which happened to be an inner city organization, would likely not have survived. Uh, and um, so now we're um, um, upon a new administration, assuming all goes forward as you have predicted, um, and many have. Um, um, but we go forward with a president who's not seen a, a legislature that is predominantly the opposite party in the Senate for, for as you said, since the 1800s, late 1800s. Um, more subsidy will likely be necessary for many of our challenged provider organizations, both hospitals and physician groups to get through what remains of this pandemic, which could be a few months or it could be um, you know, a year or two. Um, your thoughts on, um, on the ability, given the deficit, given the, the, the depth of the deficit where uh, this pandemic has taken us on what we might see from a uh, economic and funding perspective for providers and, and others? Yeah, uh, well, I, I think that we will see another, another legislative COVID relief package um, very soon. I, I think it's possible in the next week or two, the government has to be funded by December 11th. Um, the parties have been pretty far apart, but uh, I, I think it's very possible, not likely, but possible that this is an area that, uh, to Murray's question, Mitch McConnell and Nancy Pelosi and with Donald Trump maybe going along and Joe Biden encouraging it, come together and provide relief. Why do I say that? I mean, um, if you look at the packages that have been, they've been talking about, they, they include tens of billions more for provider relief. Um, and I think that becomes an important feature. Also money for states for vaccine distribution, um, given how much we're relying on the states becomes a huge driver. But, but even if it doesn't happen in December, um, you know, Joe Biden is only going to be a successful president if he can address COVID and he needs to have a package and that package will have to be bipartisan. And Republicans um, are not gonna throw up their hands and say no to everything. So I, I think if it doesn't happen in December, it'll happen in the first quarter. I think there will be more money for states. I think there will be more money for testing. I think there will be more money for specifically for vaccine distribution, which is not gonna be all distributed in the next 30 days. And I think there will be more money for providers. Uh, to your question, we're, we're in an extraordinary time and I think that policymakers generally recognize that this is a time, yes, deficits are huge and people like Murray who are concerned about them have been made careers out of it will be, but, but this is a time where I think we're gonna spend a lot more money for the next you know, six to nine months. And then we'll worry about cost containment down the road um, is, is my sense. It, the last thing I'd say, uh, uh, Rich, I was on a call earlier with um, some CEOs and they were talking about the provider relief fund. But I, I just, you know, note that's interesting is, um, you know, organi I was also surprised at how resilient the healthcare sector was. You saw a lot of hospitals and others that were doing sort of poorly. And then, yes, with government support, but they rebounded relatively quickly once you could start scheduling um you know, uh, elective surgeries and other things. And you, you frankly saw systems in Murray's, um, uh, Kaiser being a good example that are capitated um, that did quite well relative to those who are predominantly fee for service. So I think those are some interesting lessons from the pandemic as well uh, going forward. But the short answer to your excellent question is, um, I don't think the spigot will be open forever, but I think that given um, the fact that we're in for a very, very tough couple of months before the vaccine can really take hold, I, I think you'll see more provider funds flowing um, soon. Great. Mur Murray and Dean, uh, this might be a good place for us to land. Um, uh, thank you so much for the tremendous presentation, the great conversation, the questions. Uh, we are very appreciative to both of you and, um, and grateful for uh, your time this morning. So thank you, Murray and Dean. Um, uh, great to have you with us as always.
thank you for the opportunity. I look forward to seeing you all in California soon. Great. We hope so too. We hope so too. Um, I have a few closing comments to make um, and uh, our session will be ending. Um, again, I want to thank Dean Rosen and Mary Ross for just the great job that they've done uh, and their tremendous support of the Center for Healthcare Management and Policy over many years. Um, I want you to be aware that you'll be receiving an email uh, from the center uh, very soon. Uh, that email uh, will uh, thank you for joining us. We had um, uh, almost 100 participants uh, on this uh, fall speaker program event today, and it's just great to see you all here and to have you uh, be part of, um, part of our learning together. Uh, included in that email will be a survey. And so if you would please take the time uh, to complete that survey and return it to us, uh, Diane Ford and the and the, the team at the center would be uh, very grateful for that information so that we can continue to make both uh, these speaker programs as well as other events um, um, uh, that much better. Um, and speaking of important events, I um, want to remind you of the 30th Annual Healthcare Forecast Conference, uh, which, uh, as you see on the screen here, is scheduled for February 16th through the 19th. Uh, this will be a, um, a virtual event, uh, and um, unfortunately, we can't be together uh, as we um, have been traditionally for 29 straight years uh, uh, in Irvine at the Beckman Center and other locations, uh, but we will do it virtually on um, the 16th through the 19th. You see the timing on a daily basis. Uh, there is currently um, an early bird uh, discount for those of you who would uh, like to sign up. Know you're going to sign up. You might as well sign up now and do so early and get the discount. Uh, by the way, we're so grateful to all of the sponsors, the uh, California Healthcare Foundation uh, and um, the very many other sponsors who are continuing to provide support for the forecast conference and the center, uh, even despite the, uh, our need to do this virtually. Uh, I also wanna make you aware and remind many of you of the, um, the certificate program that um, Mirage sponsors entitled the Certificate in Leadership for Healthcare Management. Uh, this will be the seventh year of the certificate program and it begins in February and runs through June. Uh, it will be done virtually as well. Um, and it's a once a month event for individuals who want to further their knowledge uh, in the healthcare management field um, and is uh, highly uh, valuable for many who are already working in healthcare, physicians, nurses, executives, um, uh, persons working uh, around the healthcare industry, uh, it's, a, it's a great um, opportunity to interact with others uh, who are in the field and to all learn together. So uh, if you're interested in that, please uh, see the Mirage website uh, and uh, there's information on how to sign up for that program as well. Um, if you have any additional questions regarding this speaker program, uh, please send your questions to the, uh, the center's website. It's chcmp at mirage.uci.edu. I'll repeat that, chcmp at mirage.uci.edu. Uh, and um, Diane uh, Ford and her staff will be uh, happy to, um, to um, uh, address that question and get it to the proper place where, whether it be Dean Rosen, um, uh, Murray Ross or others uh, within the center who can answer questions and have a dialogue with you. We're very appreciative of, of your continued participation. And then my last comment then is on behalf of the Center for Healthcare Management um, uh, and Policy, uh, we want to wish everyone very happy holidays, a safe and successful new, new year. Good day.